not really going to have you turn to a text this morning um, because I'm going to kind of be uh, around different parts of the Bible, going over some different subjects. But I am going to talk to you today about about grace. And I know uh, that's something that in, in the day that we live in is kind of a popular subject, uh, but I can't say that everybody really understands what it is. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of different uh, misconceptions about grace. There's a lot of people that abuse grace, and uh, which is a shame. Uh, but grace is something that is very real. It is very, uh, it's something that's very tangible. Amen. I have experienced the grace of God in my life in so many different areas. Amen. As well as you have. I, if you, I don't know if you realize that. If you hadn't, uh, you, it's there. Amen. Every day, I would say every moment, every second, the grace of God is present everywhere. Amen. And we know that it is something that is amazing when we talk about grace, and, and I can't say that we're really going to have a chance to go over that story much about uh, that song and the writer there, but we may get there maybe another time. I've got a lot of, uh, lot of information here. I've just been studying about this subject, but how, how many knows today that grace is, is something that you have to have if you're going to be saved? Anybody that ever has been saved, that ever will be saved, is all because of grace. It's because God has given us something that we really did not deserve to have. And that's what salvation is in its inception. So uh, the title of this this morning is going to be The Gravity of Grace. The Gravity of Grace. And I want to explain to you of what grace is. And I, I, we won't be able to exhaust the subject by any means, but uh, I would ask you this question in opening up in this message today. Do we really understand what grace is? Uh, I, I know we talk about it all the time. We use the term, has anybody ever heard of a grace period at the bank? Amen. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever used the grace period, but I'm just going to say from my perspective, thank God for them. Amen. I, I may have used it a day or two in my life, and I don't like to, but uh, it's been there in my life that has had helped me before. We hear of somebody falling from grace. We hear, uh, I've heard of, uh, of musicians uh, speak of a grace note. Can't explain a lot about that, but there's something called a grace note. We describe some people as gracious in grace form, and we say grace before our meals, so we use the term very frequently, but oftentimes, I believe when we use that term, we are not embodying in our mind what grace Grace really is, how, how huge it is, how massive it is, and the measurements of grace, which really you cannot measure it because it is something that is so large. Now, I know we have a few acronyms that we use to describe it. Uh, someone has devised over the years, I think we've all probably used it in ministry, uh, the following acronym when, when it talks about the definition of grace, and they say this, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Anybody ever heard that before? We've used that acronym several times over the years, but I can't say that really, and it describes it, but it doesn't really show us the massive, how massive it really is. Uh, Vance Havner, a very clever Christian writer, once said, and he spelled this out one time, he says, G stands for the gift, R for redemption, A for access, C stands for character, and E for eternal life, which is, which is cute and nice and catchy, and I get the idea, and yes, grace is involved in all of those things. But when it comes to describing what grace really is, we must go to the Bible, we must get in the Word of God, and we must outline or try to give us a prism for what it really is. Now, a basic definition in a lexicon of what grace is, the Greek word for grace is a word, the basic idea simply means this, non-meritous. It means unearned favor, an unearned gift, a favor or blessing bestowed as a gift freely, and never has a merit for work performed. That is what it would say in a lexicon which describes what grace is. It is an unmerited favor. It is receiving a gift that you did not rightfully deserve in your life. Now, we all understand that we've experienced that great gift in our life. Now, if you would expand that definition outside of a lexicon and pick up from the theological perspective, grace is that which God does for mankind through His Son, Jesus Christ. Grace is what God does for mankind through His Son, Jesus Christ. We know that mankind could not earn their salvation. We know that you cannot purchase your salvation. It is a gift of God, and that gift is given to 
you, not because you merited that, but because God has given it to you as a free gift that you can never earn it, no matter what you would do, no matter what kind of pilgrimage you would try to make, no matter what you would do in this society, in this world, you cannot earn your salvation. Now with that said today, we know that with that word grace there, it is one of the mightiest words when it comes to being a Christian. We know that. But we have to understand what the source of grace really is. We can look at the Word at the word all day long. But we've got to look at the One who embodies what grace is. We've got to understand where the source comes from. Who is it that gives us this wonderful grace? And the amazing thing about when you study about who God is and His character and what He does, you will not study. Anybody ever heard of the attributes of God before? Even though they're numerous and we, we He exhausts every one of them, we know that love is an attribute. We know that judgment is an attribute. There's so many things. But also, we must understand that grace is one of God's attributes. It is one thing about Him that is a part of His character. It is something that it cannot be altered. It can never be changed. It doesn't matter if you don't like the definition of grace. It doesn't matter if you do like the definition of grace. You'll never change it. Add to it or take from it because God is the one that is the very source of grace in our lives. It is who He is. It is something. It's not something that He just has. It is actually something that He is. It is intrinsic. It is a part of His very being, a part of who He is. Now, with that said, we know this. Great grace is what God is like. Aren't you glad that we serve a graceful God? You ever read about Muhammad? You ever read about Allah? I'm glad I don't serve some of them, them weird gods there, I'm telling you. There's nothing graceful about them. I mean, Muhammad was a pedophile when you study his life. He was a, a wicked man. He was a man that was a murderer. And Allah, you know, you never know if you if you attain to his approval or not. You read about all these different folks, gods, even in the Old Testament, you would understand these gods were evil gods. They were, they were gods that were not necessarily fair in what they did. But I'm glad I have to say that the God that I serve is a gracious God. He is full of grace and He loves us and He has given us things that we do not deserve. And if we had somehow today, if we had to measure grace or try to find a measurement of grace, I would have to say that God is a God in His grace. That we understand it is vast. It is massive. It is something that you cannot measure nor describe. You cannot, found, you cannot find His boundaries and you cannot find its limits. It does not have a beginning and it does not have an expiration date. It is the Alpha and Omega of grace. It is everything in between of grace. It crosses every, it dots every eye and crosses every T when it comes to grace. Grace in God is something that we cannot measure. Measure. God is grace. He has no ill will. He has no meanness. He has no unfairness. Yet this works in perfect harmony with His justice and His judgment when all is said and done, some of some of humanity one day will end up in hell. And I hate to even say it, but it's true that God will have still been so gracious to them that everybody on the face of this universe would have experienced or have sampled His grace in some form or some measure. Thank God for grace. A.W. Tozer, and if you've never read behind A.W. Tozer, stop. Now, don't stop what you're doing quite now. Keep listening, but go buy your A.W. Tozer book. Amen. Now, he was a man that could just uh, describe God in such a way and His attributes in such a way. And this is from, this is a small, uh, a small quote here or a small paragraph from his book, The Attributes of God, when he's describing the grace of God. A.W. Tozer says, if we could only remember the grace of God towards us who having nothing but to merit. We would be overwhelmed by how, how immense and mass it is. So vast, so huge, that nobody can even grasp it or hope to understand it. Would, it, would, would God have put up with us this long if He only had a limited amount of grace? If He only had a limited amount of anything? He wouldn't be God. I shouldn't use the word amount, He says, because amount means a measure, and you cannot measure the grace of God. Amen. Imagine when God had put up with Terry Jones as long as he had without grace no he would not have if you extract grace from the character of God there'd be nobody in this room today that would have ever been dealt with that had ever been saved that would have ever been congratulated I feel the Lord here to remind us it's by grace that 
that we're saved. It's by grace that we're sanctified. It's by grace that we're filled. It's by grace that I'm standing. It's by grace that you've got a Bible. It's by grace that you can pray. It's by grace that you can go in the throne room. It's by grace that you're helped. If you have any help in your body and any good thing, it's all by grace. I appreciate the grace of God. Distance is the way heavenly bodies account for space they occupy. And their relation to other heavenly bodies. The moon is 250,000 miles away, says one writer. The sun is 93 million miles away. And all sort of something, or something in these measurements. But God never accounts for how mad or how big it is. You can't measure the grace of God. It's the biggest, most, uh, every attribute is so large and big that you cannot measure it. John Bunyan said this, Grace is infinite, and it had to be because our sin was infinite. When you were a sinner, you couldn't measure how sinful you were. Don't even try. I didn't do this. You were still just as wretched and rotten, just as pitiful. Oh yeah, you you were depraved. You were down there. Well, I didn't do drugs. It don't matter. You did a lot of other things. Now, I'll tell you this. You withdraw the blood of Jesus and the grace of Christ. You you withdraw that from any life. I'll tell you, the sin was so vast. So there had to be a blanket, a blanket atonement. Even though we know the sin was blanketed over humanity, there was a larger blanket, so to speak. And that blanket was was forgiveness, was justification. It all come from the grace of God. So now that we understand this, please follow me here. Now that we understand that the grace of God was so massive and so large and so humongous that no man, woman, boy, or girl can describe it. No angel or devil can comprehend it. We understand that. We ought to be overwhelmed today to understand this. That even though we know grace has been around for every generation. Yeah, how many of those grace was in the Old Testament? It was there. Grace was present then. But we also understand God. God isn't like the tide or the weather where He changes from one when one part of the Bible to the other. But in the New Testament, we are blessed with something they did not have in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ became the very channel of grace in our lives. Where in the Old Testament, they had different forms and different rituals that they could experience grace. But in the New Testament, we understand Jesus Christ is not just a trickle or just a drop of grace. He is a gushing forth of grace. He is the overflow. We live in the full way for this gracious glory in the shadow of the cross. God, whose grace cannot be measured, has been poured out and channeled through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I can get underneath the spout of Calvary and receive grace for every area of my life. Every area. In the shadow of the cross. In the Old Testament, we could talk about His grace. We could talk about His grace. But aren't you glad we have a channel into His grace? His name is Jesus. This brings me to my title today. I would refer to this as the gravity of grace. Because grace works like the earth, the earth's water system, which always flows from the highest point. It always comes from the highest point. If there's water on top of a mountain, it will work its way down into that valley. That is the very gravity of grace. Just like water, which flows from the highest point to the lowest. Just as the waters of the Niagara fall, run and plunge down to make a river below and just as the river flows ever downward to steal more low lying areas we understand that God's river of grace has come from a source that is above us that is glorious that is high that is pure and it's flowing down from heaven today if you need grace for anything it's flowing in this room if you need grace for any circumstance it is flowing there's a gravity it's coming from above he's flowing on us today he is Given us this grace in every life. One writer captures this by explaining a story when he was in England. And he said when he was in England, he looked there among the commoners in the streets. 
And you see there that one of the royalty, there of the, of the, of the kingship, the royalty of England, was walking among the common people. And we looked at this, and he said he noticed as this royalty there, as he, as he got off of his chariot, and he made his way through the crowd, and he began to stoop down to the commoners. He began to touch their children. He began to provide some necessities for some of their needs. And he said, that is what grace is. That is the gravity of grace. And when royalty begins to, to stoop down and give to those who do not deserve it. I'm telling you, I, even though we know in England that a king or a queen or a prince is just another human, we would understand their position as they would have blessed somebody that was a commoner. But how much more are we blessed to know that God and His holiness and everything about Him, He's holy, He's true, He's faithful, He has stooped down to a level, He has come to where we are, and here we experience the grace of God. It has come from royalty. It has come from kingship. It has come from a God who is ascended above everything. He's created every angel. He knows every devil. He spoke to the sun and put it into existence. He knows about the moon. He knows about every need in my life. And it flows from Him. Understanding what grace means requires us to go back to the original term in Hebrew. It means to bend. It means to stoop down. It is a condescending favor. It's when God does something for us and we do not deserve it. Oh, God help me. I've experienced this grace in every area of my life. I believe in holiness to a T. I believe you can abuse the grace of God. And you can trample His blood. But I believe God's going to deal with you in that. But I also believe just as much, if not more, in the grace of God in our lives. I've been around certain settings that were condemning. I'm not saying here, I'm just saying traveling. Where you can tell that it almost paints this picture of a tyrant God. Of a God that is a hard taskmaster of a God who does not understand nor feel the emotions or see the problems, temptations, and struggles of His people. But I found out about this God regardless what any preacher or any other human would try to label Him as. I found Him as gracious in every area of my life when I did not deserve it. When I willfully did something. Not justifying that. Not saying that should be. But God's grace found me there. He didn't overlook it and say, good job. He condemned it and said, get up. And He said, if you'll get up, I'll help you. If you get up, I'll clean your wounds. If you get up, I'll forgive you. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is the King of kings, the King of glory, who comes down to us. We see that God has stooped all throughout the Bible in this sense. The Bible is filled with examples. I was just meditating on this this morning. God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. That was grace. But even more graceful and gracious, it's God coming down and walking after they fell. Come on. You know, God, God knew they fell before He came down. Before he mounted, if you don't mind me using these terms of poetic language, before he mounted his fiery chariot, before he spoke to the cherubims and said, pull me into the garden of Eden, before he descended out of the clouds of glory, and as he dawned there in that garden, knowing very well the sins and the transgressions of Adam and Eve, he came in there asking a question, not being ridicule, not trying to be critical or trying to be condemning in the sense of destroying Adam, where art thou? It was grace that led him to kill an animal. And people said, did he kill the animal? Did he speak to the animal? I believe personally, you can believe like you want and preach it the way you want to. I believe he showed Adam how to make a sacrifice. It was grace that called God, if you don't mind me once again, poetically, getting his hands bloody. I read a book one time and when I picked the book up, it offended me at first. It said, Dirty God. And I picked it up. I said, man, that's a weird title. 
I begin to read the back of it. It's about a boy, about a man who went to a leper colony. And he said, look, my God don't mind getting dirty to reach out to somebody. Even though we know God cannot be tainted, nor, and we know He cannot be contaminated, I will tell you this, when you find them coming to Abraham, interceding there for Sodom and Gomorrah, I see graves. When you see Noah building a boat, I see graves. When I see David and Bathsheba commit their sin, and he sends Nathan with a word of, a, of, a, of reproach there, a word of dealing with him, I see graves. I see grace all throughout Scripture. I see grace in the Incarnation. You see the flow? You see the gravity of it? You see Jesus coming down in a stable as a baby? I see grace when Jesus stooped down on the ground in the dirt, in, the, in that filthy dirt, and He took His finger and He writes in the sand, not justified, but trying to help that adulterous woman. And He says unto her, Go and sin no more. I see grace. I see grace when the Holy Ghost came to this world. You understand what I'm saying? It all comes from above. This is the gravity of grace. It's God dealing in the Old Testament. It's Jesus dying in the New Testament. It's the Holy Ghost coming in the book of Acts chapter 2. It is all because of grace and not because we deserved it. It's all because of grace. I thought this was a, a wonderful illustration to make the point. There were two renowned preachers in, uh, in England, Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker. Many of us would probably recognize it, the name Charles Spurgeon. A lot of folks have never heard of Joseph Parker, who was, uh, I can't say, had a big, big, bigger ministry than Spurgeon, but was very relevant in his day. Both occupied pulpits in London. And unless you read behind some of them old preachers, they took things very personally. And they let you know how they were feeling about what you said about them. Charles Spurgeon opened an or- orphanage. And one day, Joseph Parker commented about the poor condition of the children that had been admitted into Spurgeon's orphanage. Word gets back to Charles Spurgeon. He gets in the pulpit on Sunday. And he makes some comments about Mr. Parker. Nothing as far as an evil name calling, but you know how people love conflict. All of a sudden, the next day, the front page of the newspaper. Don't you wish the church would make the front page again about good things? Front page of the newspaper. Charles Spurgeon fires back at Joseph Parker. The next Sunday, Joseph Parker goes to his church. It's packed out. Everybody's ready for the rebuttal. Boy, isn't that like humans? He gets in his pulpit. He mounts the pulpit. And Parker said, I understand today is the day that Brother Spurgeon across town raises money for his orphanage. I believe we ought to take up an offering. People got excited. They had to empty the offering plate three times. The ushers circled among the thousands there. They had to keep entering the, emptying, emptying the offering place time and time again. That Monday morning, there came a knock on Mr. Parker's office door. Mr. Spurgeon walks in. And you'd have to know how wise this guy is. He's just good with words. He said, Mr. Parker, I realize that you practiced grace on me yesterday. And Mr. Parker said, by what do you mean? He said, Mr. Parker... You gave me what I needed and not what I deserved. You gave me what I needed and not what I deserved. I would say to God, He's practiced grace on Derek Jones. He's given me what I needed and not what I have deserved. And I wish I could isolate it and compartment my lives until today. I've got to say, but I'm telling you, over the years, He's been so graceful with me. And I'm not talking about just a beauty. I'm telling you that God has just been there. God has been so faithful to me. And every time I'm able to sit back and bask in the joy of it, I'm reminded that all of it is because of grace. We all know the story of John Newton. He wrote what song? Amazing Grace. You think you knew anything about it? 
You understand, he had been raised in a Christian home in England in his very early years, but he was orphaned at the age of six, lived in a, not with a non-Christian relative. Their Christianity was mocked and hey, he was persecuted there. He was not raised in a Christian home. Newton ran away. He joined and became an apprentice seaman there in the British Navy. He served in the Navy for some time. At last he deserted. He ran away in Africa there. And he tells in his own words, we don't have time to read them, but there he joined himself to a Portuguese slave trader. And it says when the slave trader was going out of town, the wife of the slave trader would be in charge and she hated John Newton because he was a white man. And there she would abuse him and he would have to eat food off of the floor. He became living like an animal. At times he would even be caged up while living on that island there. But he, he finally broke away from that. He joined himself onto a, another ship one day. And there he broke into the realm of the ship. He passed it out among the sailors. And one day he fell off the boat and he almost drowned. He was rescued, barely alive. Toward the end of the voyage near Scotland, Newton's ship encountered heavy winds. It was blown off course and began to sink. Newton was set down to the bottom of the hole there. He had to man the pump to try to get the water out of it. He was frightened to death. He was sure that the ship would sink and he would drown. He worked the pump for days on end. He worked, he began to cry out to God. He began to remember the verses taught him as a child. And there, in that experience, he got born again and would later write these words. Amazing! in grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found I was blind but now I'm seen it's because of grace as my wife gets ready to come to the piano you can't deserve it you can't earn it God has given us grace grace 